It's episode 187 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Thanks for listening in each week. You know, we're quickly uh, running up on 200 episodes in three years of the Author Stories Podcast. It's crazy. I cannot believe that we've been going this long. And it's because of you, the listeners. Uh, because each week, new people tune in. I get feedback from people. I get letters. And uh, I just want to say thank you for listening. Click on over in the right-hand sidebar at hankgarner.com and subscribe to the show. Uh, that's how other people find it. You know, the more people subscribe and download the show, the higher we go in the rankings. And then when people are just browsing around for new things to listen to, they see our podcast there. And uh, it's because of you, the listeners. And I just wanted to say thank you. I'd also like to say thank you to some sponsors this week. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of the Author Stories Podcast, send me an email at authorhankgarner at outlook.com. And I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, but this week's sponsors... Uh, Keyport Cthulhu by Armand Rosamelia, Caitlin Rosamelia, and Chuck Buddha. Keyport Cthulhu by Armand Rosamelia, Caitlin Rosamelia, and Chuck Buddha. Uh, new version revised and expanded for 2017. The painting forced him to move back with such suddenness he nearly fell over the side of the old wooden railing. It depicted a grisly scene, as if your worst nightmare had been splattered on canvas. Despite his mind screaming to look away, he could not avert his eyes. Set in the New Jersey fishing village of Keyport, where the esoteric order of Dagon has been planning for the awakening of the Deep One all these years, who can survive when Cthulhu rises? Includes several bonus stories, the steampunk tale Rats in the Cellars, Cthulhu Unicorn, co-written with Caitlin Rosamelia, Lockbox, previously unreleased, and two Lovecraftian tales from author Chuck Buddha, The Terrible Old Man of Keyport, and Dark Waters of Sin. Keyport Cthulhu is available in print and ebook from Amazon.com as well as Kindle Unlimited. Also, Out of the Gray, book one of the Hanaria series by Patricia Gilliam. When an Earth-based terrorist group targets Hanaria's ambassador, two teenagers become entrapped in the conflict. Alex Varen is the son of an Earth Independence Party representative and doesn't want to follow his father's path of political manipulation and corruption. Rika Miller is the adopted daughter of an engineer and nurse who later discovers she's not human, but Hanarian. Alex must decide between his family loyalties and saving the life of an alien he's been taught to fear and hate, while Rika searches for the truth of what happened to her birth parents. Book one in a five-book series, Out of the Grave by Patricia Gilliam. Also, I've got a spot coming up from my friend Stefan Boltz and also from Draft to Digital. And uh, thank you for listening. Stay tuned after the show for an audio clip from Richard Gleaves and his Jason Crane series. Uh, I recently heard that Richard is starting a new trilogy in this series. Really excited to hear that. So uh, stay tuned after the show for that. Thank you for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Six Train, the new book by Stefan Boltz. Jennifer Dalton dreamed of being a singer for as long as she could remember. The dream has kept her alive throughout a childhood mired in poverty in a broken and abusive home. When her younger brother dies and her mother takes refuge in alcohol, the emotional toll becomes unbearable. One morning she runs away, taking with her the one thing she owns, her beloved six-string guitar. This is the story of a girl finding herself alone in the good and the bad, the friends she makes, and a choice that could rob her of everything she's won. Six String by Stefan Boltz, now available on Amazon.com. Hey there, Author Story listeners. This is Kevin Tomlinson from Draft to Digital, and I know that you have a book sitting there just waiting to get out to the world, and you're kind of wondering what the next steps are. So that's why you need to go visit drafttodigital.com slash author stories. That's draft, the number two, digital.com slash author stories and that's where you're going to find all the help you need to go from having a book on your hard drive to having it on someone's kindle or ipad or other reading device so go visit draft to digital.com slash author stories right now 
Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Kyle Mills on the uh, show. Uh, if you're a fan of thrillers like I am, then uh, you know Kyle and his work, uh, and he is doing some of the best work uh, in that space right now. Uh, welcome to the show, Kyle. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Kyle, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? You know, uh, my path, I think, was a little weird in that I was, I don't know, probably 28, 29 years old, and I um, was a corporate banker, and I spent all my off time rock climbing. I was really fanatic about that, and discovered I had or realized that I'd never did anything creative. So I started thinking about learning to build furniture, but I wasn't very handy. And my wife reminded me of that. And <laughs> she's actually the one that said, why don't you write a book? Really? I, partially because she didn't want me to fill the garage with tools. <laughs> and that's kind of what planted the seed. Uh, that's great. I mean, had you ever talked about this, uh, this desire? No, I'd never even, I, I'd never really even taken creative writing courses in school. I, uh, I literally went out and bought a bunch of how to write a novel books and sat down and started writing one. That is great. Um, were you an avid reader when you were younger? I was, yeah. yeah. And I'd read a ton of thriller novels. Uh, I was a huge consumer of those, probably up through high school and then, Kind of when college came, I sort of slowed down on the novels just because of the course load and then, you know, kind of picked it up a little bit back when I uh, went to work. Wow. So what uh, what got you into banking? You know, I was, a, you know, it was kind of the 80s and I was good with numbers, oddly, and uh, so I, I was getting an economics degree and uh, my father was, a diplomat at the time. And so they lived, my parents lived outside the country and I thought I'd better get a job because I have nowhere to go. <laughs> um, and there were a few, you know, it was one of those things where they, they interviewed on campus and I interviewed with everybody that would come on because, uh, I, you know, I was desperate. <laughs> so, uh, and I ended up getting an offer from a, a bank in Baltimore, which is a town I'd never, I don't think I'd ever even been to. Um, but it seemed like a good job. So I, I took it and off I went. Wow. Uh, you said your dad was a diplomat. Uh, was he in that line of work when you were growing up? Well, he was an FBI agent, uh, for the entire time I was growing up when I, he was a diplomat. He attached to the FBI, uh, when I was in kind of, as I was leaving from college, he moved to, uh, my family moved to London. And he was the legal attaché there for many nice. years and then uh, became the director of Interpol. Nice. Um, did uh, his connections with the FBI and then later in uh, uh, diplomatic work and Interpol, did, did that have an effect on the types of stories that drew you in? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, really, um, I loved all kinds of books when I kind of embarked on this journey of writing a novel and I never really had any expectation to get published. I just thought it would be an interesting thing to do. Um, and, and as I was thinking, well, what kind of book would I want to write? I mean, I, I've read all kinds of books. I thought, honestly, I'd always loved thrillers when I was a kid, but I also thought, um, you know, I had all these contacts, you know, through, throughout the intelligence community uh, but I, I mean, these are people I'd grown up with. It was people you always, you'd, I'd known my whole life and it was before the internet. So I thought, well, that would make the research really easy. Um, so I think I'll write a thriller novel about the FBI because it was what I knew. Um, and that's what I did. My first character was a, an FBI agent. So, so your wife plants the, the bug, uh, in, in you to write a novel, uh, and, and like you said, probably to keep you from amassing tools in the garage. But, um, when, when you started thinking about that, you said that, uh, the FBI is what you gravitated toward. Uh, but kind of, uh, I, I mean, when you just started thinking about it, did, did the story just start to form itself up? Uh, I, I think a lot of times when we've never thought about it before, 
uh, you know, we, we just never put those muscles to work. But then when you do, uh, the story kind of starts growing. Uh, is, is that kind of what happened with you? Yeah, you know, it was funny. That was a very high concept book uh, because I wasn't sure what I went, like what the story would be. And I had been at a party that fairly re- before that that um, I had been debating with somebody after a few drinks that the drug problem in the United States. Now, it doesn't get as much play now, but it was, you know, the war on drugs was a big deal back then, pre-terrorism. And uh, I had said, well, you know, they could just poison the drug supply. And then, you know, that would sort of, it would sort of take care of its pro- itself. I would say I was joking. And I started thinking about that as an idea. I thought, what if somebody really did that? Um, and it was an interesting idea because it was kind of ambiguous. You know, I thought some people would probably be for it. Some people would be against it. And what would the motivations be? And how would the FBI deal with it? Um, and that's kind of how it grew. And I'm not a big, you know, I'm not one of those people that you know, gets struck by lightning and thinks of the whole book. I have a little <laughs> bit more of a plodding uh, my thought process. So, you know, that, that turned into very much, you know, back then, because I knew so much about the FBI, I thought, well, what if somebody did this? Well, how would the FBI react? There would be a certain way that they would react. And then you know, the more fun was you had to figure out how you would do it. Um, and that turned out to be more complicated than, you know, at first it seemed. Right. Um, you said that you started collecting books about, uh, you know, how to write. Uh, what were some of the things that you picked up? And now as uh, an accomplished writer, uh, when you look back on that, uh, was that good advice that you got from the beginning? Or uh, <laughs> is, uh, you know, ha- has that worked out well for you? You know, I those books. I think just like anything, there's good and there's bad. And it also depends on what you want out of them. Um, What I discovered, and this is, you know, again, this is, you know, way before the internet. So, you know, you kind of had to go to a bookstore and look around and see what was there. Right. um, A lot of them were very motivational. Um, And that's not the way my process works. You know, I set myself to doing something and I do it. And so I didn't really need the motivation. So I had a bunch of those that I kind of discarded. What I really wanted was the nuts and bolts. How do you do it? Like, how long should a paragraph be? You know, I mean, it was just really mundane stuff like that. That I wanted a blueprint, basically, which is probably a little, looking back on it, maybe a little naive. But But those are things that people don't think about that. Yeah, those are things that, that people don't think about when you when you sit down to do it, and you're, uh, you're getting into the word processor, and you're like, uh, "What font do I use? How you know how how are pages mm-hmm. set up?" and and those things matter to writers. Yeah, and you know, it's my motto has always been get the easy stuff right. So oh. the you know this, and and I in in many writers that I've worked with, young writers and stuff, they. Um, maybe take the opposite approach a little bit. Uh, they, they are not very knowledgeable about novels or about writing. And they seem to, they dive in and, uh, pro- you know, the, the fact that there, it's an art and a craft and that you need to get the craft right. And it's much, it's helpful. I mean, it's, why, why it's sort of like musicians where sometimes a musician will tell you, that they, you know, they don't want to sit there and practice scales all day because it'll ruin their creativity. And to which I say, no, it won't. It'll make you able to do whatever you want, whatever comes into your head. And that's what I wanted to get. And I, and I often try to impress that on people is you know, learn this stuff. I mean, you can always discard it or ignore it, but you want to know. Right, right. Uh, so that first book that you started writing, did did you finish that uh, that initial idea that you had? Yeah, yeah. It actually turned out to be the fastest book I ever wrote. Um, really? Yeah, I must how, have been really motivated. <laughs> <laughs> how long did it take you? I think it took me about eight months after I finished all the uh, how to write a book books. 
Wow. Those took me about a month to read, and then I think uh, I knocked the uh, the rest of it out in a month. Wow. Did uh, or eight, I'm sorry, eight months. I knocked that out in a month, right. and I knocked out the book in eight months. <laughs> Wow, what did you what did you do when you finished it? When you got to the end, uh, not much. I think I like I kind of paused and um, and kind of, it took me a long time. I actually gave it to a couple of people that I worked with who were big readers and told them that a friend of mine had written it and <laughs> that I wanted. That I, and then I figured they'd give me their honest opinion. And because I, when I looked at it, I, I couldn't see it as a book, so I couldn't see if I if it really was a book or if it was just nonsense that I'd written down and that people would read it and it would come off as I don't know really stupid. And uh, they both really liked it. And then I sent it to my dad, who's obviously pretty well versed in the. Um, in that world and was a big thriller reader. Um, I sent it to my mother and, I, and he read it. And, you know, like most fathers, he, he doesn't like to miss an opportunity to criticize me. And he, uh, <laughs> he really liked it. He said, you know, this is one of the better thrillers I've read in quite a while. And I wow. thought, wow, you know, I mean, if he liked it, then maybe I've actually got something here and I should try to get it try to get it published and so i embarked on that whole soul crushing uh <laughs> you know thing and got the million rejections just like everybody and um eventually managed to get it published which book was that it was called rising phoenix wow that's a that's really remarkable you know that your first attempt uh, well, first off, that your first attempt without any kind of developmental edit or anything like that, that, that it starts resonating with people. And, and, uh, of, of course it, it took you a while to get it published like, like everybody. But, uh, uh, but it sounds like that, uh, was a kind of a once in a lifetime experience. It's awesome. Um, and yeah. yeah, it was interesting with, with Phoenix Rising, that was the introduction of your character, Mark Beeman, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. Yes. So what what was it about Mark? Where did that character come from? He was a kind of a composite of a lot of people I had met at the FBI. I mean, there was certainly some of my father in there and a number of other people I'd known over many years. Um, you know, there, there was, it maybe isn't quite as true now with the FBI. The FBI has become a much more intellectual uh, and sophisticated probably, I guess, would be the words. I don't think I'll make anybody too mad with that um, organization. Uh, and the threats that they face are now are a bit more of a grand scale. Um, but back in the day when I was growing up, they were a little more cowboy than they are now. You know, I mean, my father would get in his big blue FBI LTD and charge off across Oregon and <laughs> you know, go and arrest guys on, you know, by himself or he'd go and grab a couple of sheriffs in a little town, go on to the Indian reservation and arrest people. You know, I mean, it wasn't like it is now. I mean, my father's been thrown out of second story windows and shot at and attacked by monkeys. And I mean, he says all these crazy stories that would never be allowed to happen now. You know, they'd fly in a SWAT team or something. Right, right. Um so there are a lot of these kind of cowboy FBI agents out there that were just really colorful people. And uh, I wanted to capture that a little bit. That's awesome. Um, so you finally uh, found a buyer for the book. Uh, what, when, you, when you landed that with a publisher, uh, how did the process go from there? Did, uh, how long did it take for the book to come out? You know, it was really fast. Um, that it was a strange process for me because first of all, I signed a two book deal and I never really planned on writing a second book. So that was a little terrifying and I didn't have an idea for a second book. Um, and then what, kind, what happened to me and I think was certainly very helpful. I mean, the publisher was really behind the book anyway, but uh, a book that they had uh, slotted in that was a pretty big book had, got, had gotten delayed. 
so I, so I was sort of in this weird position of, you know, I, I got the deal and then everybody said, you know, you know, now it's going to be like a year and a half or something. We'll do editing and we'll do blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden they called and said, you know, like, I don't even remember what it was, maybe five months or something. They said, nope, we've got to get this thing edited and into production because we're, we've got to move it into this other sl- book slot. So it was just an absolute whirlwind from, you know, I signed the deal to we've got to get this thing, you know, in the hopper, which was a strange situation for me because I didn't know, I didn't have any idea how that process worked. So <laughs> right. I was completely clueless. Uh, and it was just a very strange feeling of, you know, being around all these people who have been in the industry forever. And I had never even really gotten better than a C in English. I felt like just the, the biggest fraud. <laughs> and, but, I, but we managed to get through it. Love it. Did, did anything take you by surprise in that editing process? Uh, um, other than you, you felt like that you shouldn't have been there in the first place, but, um, you know, you, you kind of get attached to these stories and these characters. Was there anything that was really hard to, to let go of or change? Not too bad on that book because one, I'm really careful about how I write my book. So I write, and even back then, just huge outlines, absolutely like ridiculous outlines. They could be 35,000 words. And I go, you know, I had back then I had all these crazy things like flow charts and, uh, you know, different, different uh, levels of outline. And I had stuff laid out on the floor that, you know, the, the plot line and all this stuff. So, you know, I'd done a lot of research. I knew a lot about the FBI. So it was, my books I think are fairly clean when I go in, um, even that first one, oddly. So, and also they, they didn't have that much time to edit it. So, I mean, it had to go into production. So it turned out to be a fairly uh, painless process uh, with that one. That's great. Um, after that book was published, uh, how long was it before you started your follow-up? Started it pretty much right away. Uh, that, yeah, that, I mean, I started it at probably just like a month after I uh, finished the first one or, or, or got the first one sort of out the door, you know, got it through page proof and, and all that stuff. Because at that point, they had a publishing schedule in mind and I'd already been kind of compressed at the front end. So, um, yeah, that. It was a, that was a very stressful thing because I honestly, there was, I didn't feel like there was any way I could get a second book done. Um, you know, the first book was interesting. I had an idea that was very, like I said, very high concept. It was once you have that idea in your head, to some extent, the book writes itself. And the second book, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do really. And then I discovered it's much more complicated when you're with a, a publisher because everybody was pulling me in all these different directions and <laughs> um, they were shooting down all my ideas and it was really horrible. Um, it, it was really probably the most stressful time in my life. I My hands shook all the time and my hair started turning gray and um, I finally... I finally, and somewhat famously, I think, or infamously, I should say at this point, I, I said to my wife one night, you know, I hate this. I just hate it. Would it, would it be okay? Because I had left my job because I was like, there's no way I can write another book and work full time in the time frame they want it. But I said, would it bother you if I quit and just went back to my job in banking? Because they'll take me back. And she said, no, I think that'd be great. I think you're going to die. Like you're going to have a stroke at 29. <laughs> and uh, so I, that was back when fax machines were around. So I, I, like at midnight, I faxed a letter to my agent saying, I haven't spent any of the money. Can I just give it back and quit? And uh, I got a call very early in the next morning from him. <laughs> and he said, uh, write any, I talked to them. They said, write any book you want. Nobody's going to call you again. Wow. Uh, and nobody did. <laughs> I wrote a second book and delivered to them on time. Uh, and they, and they <laughs> loved it. 
So thank God. <laughs> So, so what I'm hearing is that creativity by committee uh, never works. You know, it didn't. And, and to, you know, I don't want to make those guys villains or anything. I think a lot of their ideas were good and maybe some of my ideas were bad. But, you know, you are in control. And it, but I didn't know, like, I couldn't say that to myself because, again, I felt like a complete fraud. And so all these smart people who have been very successful in publishing me are pulling me and pushing me in all these different directions. And they assumed that I am sure that they were being helpful. They were tossing some ideas out there and I would um, accept them or discard them however I felt. And, but what I, what I was seeing was I need to incorporate all these ideas into one book. And, you know, that obviously wasn't going to be possible. Uh, but I, I don't think that's the way they intended it. So anyway, I, I uh, managed to get that second book done, and it was quite a bit better than the first. I'd learned a few things along the way, and uh, that one did that one did pretty well. I, the first one had done well, but the second one was hit the New York Times list. So uh, yes. that was a that was kind of a big deal for me. Yeah, were were you glad that you didn't go back to banking at that point? <laughs> I was, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it sort of vacillates depending on the book, but uh, right, right. They've never, there's never been another book that was that bad. So um, I think, uh, and it's funny because my my father oddly was really good friends with Tom Clancy just through kind of FBI stuff, and uh, Tom had said to, told, had told me that. Yeah, you know, the second one's the worst. That it that way about him, and he and he said, you know, anybody can write one book, but two's hard. And I yeah. thought, thanks for that. That was helpful. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but he, he said, but on the bright side, if you can write two, you can write a hundred. Right. So uh, I finished the second one, and I thought, well, Tom said that now I'm okay. I can I can write right. as many as I want. <laughs> right. Now, now I, I feel like I earned what uh, what I thought I was a fraud uh, about, you know, earlier. Oh uh, so yeah, great. that took a little while. I, I, right, it would be interesting right. to know when I stopped feeling like that. It was a long time <laughs> into my career. <laughs> oh, that's great! I'm glad to hear that other people uh, wrestle with those same things. You know, uh, like like you write something and you get a letter from a reader and they they say something really. Uh, you know, resonated with them or something. You're like, really? I mean, did I write that? Because I'm not that profound, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's you know, great. and there's no real, I guess maybe if you went and got your MFA or something, you'd feel, I don't know, more qualified. If you're like, you know, if you're a doctor, you go to medical school, you get out and you say, yeah, I'm a doctor. But I was like so many writers, really. I mean, in my generation, a lot of lawyers became writers and you exactly. just kind of think, yeah, I, it's sort of like, oh, you know, well, I didn't really go to high school, but I've decided, you know, to hang out a shingle as a surgeon. I'll pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> right. The first 10 I'm going to practice on, those are free. <laughs> yeah, those won't be that good. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Oh, man. You, you talked about your outlining and how that you're a pretty uh, or a very detailed uh, outliner. Um how do you, and, and you know, there's, there, of course, there's these two camps, or, or we like to pretend that there are only two camps, people that are outliners or people that are kind of fly by the seat of their pantsers. And, uh, and, you know, the, the real truth is, is that a lot of people are in the middle there somewhere. Um, and, you know, people like Stephen King are very, you know, famous for, for saying, Things like if you outline a book, it's going to be dead and it's not going to be any fun for the reader, much less the writer and and all this kind of stuff. Yet, when you write the kind of books that you write, uh, I would assume that you would have to have a very detailed outline and to keep up with all the characters and the different plots and subplots and, and all of the machinations that are going on in the background. Um, but as a writer, how do you deal with that level of detail? And that level of granular control over plot lines and things like that, while making the book fun to read and and creating great characters, because your books are full of great characters that you care about and uh, and that gets you involved in what's going on with them. 
Yeah, for me, the, the outlining process is kind of a creative process. I write the very long outlines and everything, but it's a lot of stuff about character. It's kind of when I get to understand the story and understand who the characters are and where they're going without having the pressure of having to actually write anything that, that's even marginally eloquent. It can just be a sketch, you know, of what if, you know, so-and-so is this way or he feels this way about that or whatever. But it also depends on how complex your plot lines are and how much you personally, how much ability you have to keep a lot of stuff in your head. So, Tom Clancy, for instance, people assume that he wrote very elaborate outlines, but he didn't really outline at all. Um, he just could keep all that stuff in his head. So I can't. Um, That's incredible. And, uh, yeah, it is. You know, Tom was a genius. I don't use that word very often, but if you met him, he was like just off the charts smart and knowledgeable about everything. I mean, the guy was, really was incredible. But, you know, you can't, you know, you can't do it like that. I, most people, I feel like, and my books are pretty precise. I like them to be very realistic. So the timelines are very precise and there's got, you know, a lot of things going on. And sometimes the characters are a little ambiguous. So for me, it's important to get all the detail right. Um, if you're Stephen King, you know, you got a bunch of vampires running around. It's not quite as plot driven. Um, right. Or sometimes not at all plot driven. Yeah. And, and he likes to have a lot. I mean, he'll have a lot of characters and they're kind of day in the life stories until things go terribly wrong. And that's not a, as much of a, this has to happen. And these people have to know this before, you know, Y can happen and Z can happen. And, um, that sure. for my my in my books that uh, they tend to be very precise and sometimes a little complicated that way. But if you're too complicated and you don't get it right, then your books can go from being kind of fun, complicated to confusing. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, your books are also uh, very timely and uh, you know in, involve plots. Uh, that sometimes seem like they're they're pulled right out of the headlines of what's going on today, or what could happen, or what might be happening behind the scenes if we really knew, you know, the real story, uh, so to speak. Um, how do you how do you balance, uh, you know, writing these great storylines, uh, but also taking care to uh, to not write stories that might be obsolete in a year or two? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's super hard. I mean, I, I'll say yeah, I, I, wrote a book, I wrote a book called Sphere of Influence, and I turned it in like five days before 9-11, and the storyline the story was very much that. I mean, it was all about al-Qaeda, which at the time no one had ever even heard of. I'd had to call the CIA to figure out if that was even – and we had a debate, actually. About, was that what he, the terrorist group was even called? Because it kind of translates to the base, and they thought, oh, no, they just, they're just referring – to their base. And so no one really knew anything about them. They'd never done it in the United States. And, you know, that happened. And my wife called me and said, turn on the TV, your book's playing out on the TV. And I looked oh and, you know, I was like, Oh my God. And, you know, I mean, obviously it was an incredible tragedy. And a few days later I got a call from my editor and she said, well, we can't publish this now. Um, oh no. And cause you know, it would have come out, you know, like, yeah, books are, they don't come out for a long time. Well, sure. and it would look like I was, I had just sort of grasped on that and written it. So there was an example of one that I was too soon. You know, I, I pushed it too far and oh, wow. ended up having to rewrite. You know, I said, no, set, don't do anything with it. I'm just going to rewrite a bunch of it. And I think I have an idea how I can just completely obscure all this. Um, and, you know, you, you, that's kind of the danger. You know, right now it's very, very difficult. You know, I'm looking at, you know, starting a new book here in the next couple of weeks, and the, the world has become so volatile uh, that you think about even, you can't really even write about Syria because in a year right. you have no idea. I mean, the United States could be occupying it. Russia could have blown it off the map. I mean, you just have no idea. So, um, 
you, now we're, everybody, I think, is going to have to dial back a little bit and, and, and maybe, maybe ample, yeah, kind of z zero in on, on some smaller ideas. Um, right. Out of fear that that, like you say, they could just become obsolete halfway through writing the book. Well, I would imagine that uh, when you reach the level that you've reached in publishing, uh, that the uh, uh, the ability to draw on certain sources probably opens up to you. Uh, you know, uh, maybe people you can talk to and do research with. Uh, has, has that happened? Have you uh, gotten access to uh, maybe intelligence agencies or things like that that you can, uh, you know, ping things off of uh, for new novels? Yeah, the, for me, I, were, I think I went about it backward. I, I had that access before I started writing. So my writing has not really produced a lot of, like, say, you know, like Vince Flynn or somebody like that who – you know, started, he was a bartender when he first wrote his first book, but then became, started becoming friends with all these intelligence and military people as he wrote books um, and got that access. Whereas I, you know, the, those were the people that uh, I knew. I mean, the FBI director gave me a blurb for my first book because, you know, he'd been a family <laughs> friend forever. So that wasn't too that was never too difficult for me. Um, but certainly people like Vince or Brad Thor or whoever, they, they went about it more in the normal way that they became well-respected writers. And from that, uh, those contacts and, and friendships flowed. Yeah. Uh, which book of yours uh, was the most fun to write uh, when you got to the end of it that you were just – you know, smile on your face and you're like, wow, I really pulled that off. Well, those might be two different categories for me, I think. <laughs> uh, and oddly, neither one. I don't know that either one would have been necessarily one I wrote from under my own name. I, I, uh, I've always been a big fan of the zombie genre ever since I was a little kid. And, uh, so when I, the Robert Ludlum's estate called me and wanted me to resurrect a, a, a series that they had done, and it was kind of science-oriented, and I figured out a way to basically write a zombie book. And I'd always oh, wanted nice. to write a zombie book. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Like, I just, I had a blast figuring out how you would, because I'm very science-oriented, so how would you create a zombie, really? Like, how would it actually be physically possible they weren't really zombies. They weren't dead or anything, but, um, and then turn it into a thr like a really credible thriller that people would read it and think, yeah, this could happen. Um, that was a lot of fun. <clears throat> as far as, wow, I pulled this off. It was the last book that I published, which again, which again, wasn't under my name. It was under Vince Flynn's name. And I finished that book. That was one of those books that just, came together like it never I never had the whole stand in the shower for two hours trying to figure out a problem or anything like that it was like everything just fell into place and I finished it and I thought like Vince if he was still alive would be saying yeah that I, I like that book um and so I was, was really that order to kill about that that was order to kill yeah I finished that book and I thought yeah, that's what I. That's exactly what I was shooting for, and that doesn't necessarily always happen. As you know, as you know, as a writer, you think you have grand schemes, and you think, yeah, I wrote a good book, but that wasn't necessarily like if I was a better writer, it would be better. And that right. book, I thought that was every word. That is what I think as a fan. That is what I think a a really fun mid trap. Uh, you know, Vince Flynn novel is like if I read that and he'd read it, he'd written it, I think that's exactly what I wanted to read. So yeah. hopefully fans agree, but it looks like for me anyway, I, I was fired up about it. Yeah. Um, speaking of that book, uh, you and Vince uh, kind of got your start around the same time, I think, and 
maybe even Brad Meltzer and uh, uh, Brad Thor, maybe. I, I think I'd read something about you guys were going to get together years ago or something and didn't work out. Uh, but uh, how did you uh, come to to kind of uh, to take this new book of his and, and, and write it? How did that all come about? Yeah, this sort of out of the blue again. Um, you know, I had heard that he had passed away and I hadn't really given much thought to whether the series would continue beyond the fact that I was a fan of the series and I, I kind of sure. hoped it, selfishly hoped it would because I loved that character. Um, and my assumption was that if, if it was going to happen, they had chosen somebody because Vince had been ill for quite a while and that he had chosen somebody to do it. And uh, what it was, it was a six months later or something, I can't remember, I got a call from my agent and he said, you know, I was having lunch with Vince's agent and I said, you know, I asked if, if they were going to carry it on and he said, yeah. And he said, you know, I, <laughs> what Kyle Mills is doing is doing Ludlum stuff right now. And uh, you should, you should see, you know, you should talk to him if you decide you want to do it. And they they and sure enough they did. They called me and kind of asked me what what ideas I had for moving it forward. And um, I I was probably a, ter- was a terrible interview because I you know kind of gave them some general ideas where I thought I'd take it. But then I said you know I, I probably won't do any of that though. You know once I start thinking about it, I'll go in a different direction. But and I thought <laughs> well I probably probably didn't get that job. But strangely enough, like a week later, they called and said, yeah, that sounds good. Just, you know, take it where you think. You obviously, you know, I think it was probably pretty obvious that I had read, read the books and, you know, sure. was a fan and understood the character and, and sort of what made it tick and all that. So um, I was really excited about it because, you know, it's such a great character and the fans are yeah. really terrific. Rabid. And, <laughs> yeah, super rabid, but, you know, kind of in a good way, you know, that they're, yeah, yeah. that they love it and they're fired up about it and they're paying attention, which is nice. Right. You know, you work so hard on your book if somebody's paying attention. Well, I, uh, I just finished the audio book of Order to Kill, uh, maybe a week or two ago. And, uh, I've, of course, been a big Vince Flynn fan, uh, but also a big fan of yours. And I was really, uh, excited to see how this was going to work. Uh, because, you know, does it, is it, uh, Vince's characters, but it sounds like Kyle, you know, you know, how, you, you just wonder how this is going to work. And I have to say, you absolutely nailed Vince's voice. Uh, but it, uh, at, at, at the same time, I could feel you there as well. I know that's a weird thing to say, and I, I don't really know how to put it in words, but, uh, it was like the perfect combination of a Vince Flynn novel with Kyle Mills, you know, riding shotgun or whatever. It's, uh, uh, how do you approach that? First off, uh, taking someone else's existing property, uh, when you already have such a, uh, a unique voice of your own and blend those two things. You know, with Vince's stuff, it was a challenge. I mean, the, I went back and read that entire series and took a huge amount of notes. What I really wanted to create on that, on the first book, the, the survivor, was basically a forgery. A guy, he, Vince had written three pages, not even, uh, of that book. And it was uh, a storyline that arced from the prior book called The Last Man. And, that, and so my goal was, and what I thought was the interesting challenge, I'm always looking for a new challenge with every book I write. Sometimes it's subtle, you might not notice it, but I do something different. Um, but that was an interesting challenge to me. I thought, you know, I, what I want to do is ask people, and I did ask a lot of people, where do you think Vince left off and I started? And I want to see if anybody like knows. And that, I think, was the, with the driver behind the survivor. Um, with Order to Kill, you know, you can't, you can't sort of endlessly forge books. So... <laughs> Uh, that one I needed to say, you know, how can I make this viable with me doing it and, and also, you know, carry it forward. You know, Vince had been dead for a while and the world was changing pretty quickly. So um, he had not really dealt with Russia much historically. I mean, he was, you know, very much about um, Islamic terrorism and 
I felt I wanted to branch out and I also create characters that are maybe a little more ambiguous than Vince ever would. Um, and I, I, I also wanted to have Mitch be a little, go back to being a little softer than he was toward the end of that series. He became very angry. Um, yeah. And make him a little more Bredeka's humanity just a little bit. So, you know, you have like a Grisha Azarov, which is a Russian character in that book. It's probably not a, a character that Vince would have been as attracted to. He was kind of a very ambiguous character. He wasn't really good. He wasn't really evil. He just was um, a little more gray than Vince tended to write in, you know, good guy, bad guy, which is fun. You know, it's kind of a modern Western. Um, right. And I've always explored the gray. So, and even in this, this, the next book, um, Enemy of the State, we kind of had a, a heated debate about a character that maybe doesn't get his as much as a lot of people would expect in the book. But I don't know. I was interested in kind of the concept of redemption. And again, not, not necessarily a, a theme that Vince explored a whole lot. But um, I thought it was interesting and fun and a little different. So we went with it, and we'll see if fans, the tops of their heads blow off. They might. might. (laughs) What about your work with with Robert Ludlum, uh, with his estate? You you talked about the um, uh, the the book that you you found a way to make a zombie story. Uh, How did you get brought in to do that, and, and kind of what were you tasked with? That was really out of the blue. That was, I mean, they just called me and said, do you want to, yeah, we read one of your books, a book called Darkness Falls. And, we, you know, it was, it was kind of, sci- I'm a big science geek and it was kind of a science oriented thriller. And they said, we think you're perfect for writing this sort of science oriented series that had, you know, that Robert Ludlum had started and, and it had gone on and had a few writers work on it. He'd passed away and then it kind of, went fallow for a long time. And they said, you know, we would like to re-resurrect it. And, you know, that, I honestly said no initially. I mean, it's not something I'd ever really considered doing. Um, And, you know, I had my own career and it was going fine and everything. And then I thought, I started thinking about it a little more and I thought, you know, that might be kind of fun. I was a huge Ludlum fan. So, and I had a bunch of very science-y oriented ideas that, I thought would have fit and maybe I wouldn't have fit as well with me for my books as they would with his. So, um, you know, I took that on and, and, to, uh, yeah, you know, wrote the, wrote the zombie book then wrote a book about, you know, the future of, uh, kind of the human and, and machine combining. And then another one on, uh, uh, a war between uh, a potential war between Japan and, and China with a bunch of futuristic weapons. So, I mean, it's not sci-fi for sure. It's it's thriller. It's written in the thriller style, but there's sort of some some science fiction themes in there in the sense of you know what's next with technology. And I love that stuff. I loved uh, I loved researching it and trying to weave it in there. And honestly, the funny thing is the last one I wrote about the war between the high tech war between China and Japan is one that I had tried to get Tom Clancy to write. Uh, Cause I thought, you know, I, 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 that it would be the perfect idea for him because he's so brilliant with all that kind of m- machinery and strategy and, and weapon systems and all that. I would love to have, I always wanted to see what would spring from his brain on right, that. He kind of um, gave it the bear and dragon treatment. Yeah, exactly. And I thought this yeah. would be this would be really cool. Uh, and he had he was working on something else, and then I, you know he passed away. And uh, this was years ago that I had mentioned the idea. So I thought, well, since clearly you know Tom did not get a chance to write it, I'm going to dig in and and try it. And it was a lot of fun again because. You know, you're looking into these new two technologies and what DARPA is doing and all this, and uh, just super interesting subject matter. Those Ludlum books were a lot of fun to write. I I enjoyed that uh, that series. I had I had enjoyed it as a fan too. Right, right. Uh, 
your your books uh, are very uh, like like we said timely and really deal with uh, kind of big picture things that are going on in the world. Uh, I you know over the last couple of years our our real world has gotten to be very contentious and, uh, and you talked about how things are changing and it just you know things are ramping up. Uh, how do you prevent uh, or how do you keep from uh, from becoming ideological in your stories or, you know, having stories take on a certain, uh, worldview, uh, while maintaining some neutrality as the writer? Uh, is, is that a struggle? And, uh, kind of how do you step back and see the story for what it is? Well, my, I'm probably the anti ideologue. I, I just have no political ideology at all. I, I, um, I look at, I, I look at every problem the world faces as sort of a math problem. There's probably a right or wrong answer. There's, there's one answer is better than the other. And so I've always explored both sides. That, that's kind of what I've always been interested in. You know, the, the, I, I treat the main, the uh, protagonist, antagonist, equally in the sense of why are they doing these things? How will they affect the world? And to me, it's almost like presenting both sides of a problem. How would one person solve it? How would the other person solve it? Now with Vince's books that I'm doing now, um, it's kind of the opposite of that in the sense that Vince was very ideological and very, very conservative in his politics. So that is, doesn't just shine through in his books. I think it's a, kind of a, an important component of his books. So whereas my books are much more an exploration of uh, many sides and the grays in, in every situation, Vince's are um, much more conservative uh, and much more good guy versus bad guy, and there is no real gray. Um, it's kind of Mitch's way or the highway. Uh, so mine are maybe a little more ambiguous than that, the ones that I've written, but well, other than the survivor. But I think that is a component that was integral to his success. I think he had an audience that was very, um, very excited about having, you know, that voice of listening to that voice, maybe it uh, dovetailed with their feelings about politics and, and geopolitics in the world. And uh, uh, that's what makes it fun, I think. Yeah. Um, Kyle, what's coming up next from you? I, I think you've, you've finished your uh, book in the Mitch Rapp series uh, recently, haven't you? Yeah. Yep. Enemy of the State. So that's, coming out uh, in September. Uh, so will the first Mitch Rapp movie, uh, American Assassin, come out right around the same time. Um, and then other than that, I'm, I actually don't know. Uh, the one, one of the weird things about uh, being an author is that you're periodically completely unemployed. So <laughs> I am sitting in Arizona catching some sun right now as I talk and I am completely unemployed. So we'll see if that <laughs> every, awesome. every time it happens, I think this is it. This is after the last book and I'm going to be unemployed for the rest of my life. And it never seems to occur. So we'll right. see. this may be it. I say that every, every oh. year, this may be it. I tell my wife, I might be, I may be done. <laughs> And then you'll be standing in the shower tomorrow and you'll say, oh, crap, I, this is a book I have to write. Yep. Somebody, somebody yep. will say, hey, why don't you write another book? Um, <laughs> well, I, I'll say it. Will you write another book when this one's over? <laughs> For sure, I'm going to write another book. And, uh, of course. We'll, we'll see, we'll see what, what happens with it if anybody wants to publish it. <laughs> I, I'm, I don't think you'll have any problem there, Kyle. Um, Kyle, thank you so much for taking time uh, to come on the show. Where can people find you on the web if they're uh, maybe not familiar with your work and they want to dig through your back catalog and get up to speed with what's going on with you? It's just kylemills.com. 
Excellent. And I'll put a link to it in the show notes and a link to your Amazon page. Uh, Kyle, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. It's been fun. Thanks for listening. Now stay tuned for an audio clip from Richard Glebes. Find a link in the show notes. They sat in silence, leaning on Spook Rock. It pulsed against his back, in rhythm with his heart. He fought an urge to press his palms to it and steal its mysteries. Kate took her hand away. This fundraiser for my father's campaign, was it your idea? No. I didn't think so. You need to watch out. For what? She stood and paced, hands in pockets, avoiding his eyes. Right now, you're a free agent. Nobody knows what you can do except me and Joey. That's rare. You've got space to find your own path without everybody watching you or controlling you. How many of them, us, are there? A few handfuls of families. We used to be all over, but we're kind of dying out. The secrecy issue makes it hard for us to find each other, hard to find people to marry and the like. So we congregate in a few obvious places. Salem, Sleepy Hollow, Transylvania? Don't be stupid. There's no monsters, just people. And ghosts. Ghosts are people. They were. She held her arms out. That's all there is. People in the spirit world. And places in between. Magic places. Haunted places. Like this. We gravitate to towns where we can stick together. It sounds nice. It can be smothering. We have factions. Not all of us want to get by in peace. Some of us, my father is one, say we need to be more aggressive, increase our numbers, take charge of things, politics, finance, fix the world. People listen. They think they're special. They don't call themselves the gifted. They call themselves the appointed, as if God singled them out to rule. My dad's a good man. He just thinks he knows what's best for everybody, and you'll be meeting his crowd. At the fundraiser? It will be mixed, mostly normals, but I'll point out the dangerous ones. My father employs a man named Mather. You can't miss him. He has purple eyes. Mather is like this rock. He'll be able to sense you. If you want to stay a free agent, you'll need to avoid him. Or else what? They'll want to recruit me? You're Ichabod's descendant. Ichabod was attacked and survived, a potential founder. They're already watching you. I'm no good to anyone. You don't believe that. Neither do I. She knelt and pushed the hair out of his eyes. What am I going to do with you, Jason Crane? Love me, he thought. He felt himself lean forward. They would kiss here in this sacred place beneath the stars. Stars? Stars? What time is it? Jason jumped to his feet. We need to go. Why? A firefly swept the air, flared yellow-green, and died. What's wrong? She followed his gaze and gasped. Fireflies swam in every dark crevasse. Faces coalesced where the lights hovered. Faces of crones and young boys and stern men. Emaciated, hale, wounded, vacant, menacing, piteous. Bodies took form. Military uniforms, bonnets, black lace, crepe, shrouds, winding sheets. Sleepy Hollow Cemetery had disgorged its dead, and that grand army of spirits now made camp at Spook Rock to await orders from their leader. A laugh chopped the wood of the forest. Jason had heard that laugh before. He squeezed Kate's hand. Run. Thanks for tuning in to the Author Stories podcast. You can find new episodes.